Mata de long name. Yeah, long name yeah. Rodrigo Mata de Cabral Carvalho. Yeah, that was great. Um, <laughs> coming to us from Brazil, from Sao Paulo, um, Federal University ABC, um, undergraduate in um, in engineering and physics. Yeah, I'm a physicist. Yeah. Physic but, yeah. yeah. And um, take it away. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here and give the last talk of the conference. And uh, this work is about um, a bridge between the subjective, uh, the subjective experience during the acute effects of ayahuasca, brain dynamics, and also the subacute effects of ayahuasca, which for us will mean basically one day after the ingestion. Um, there is no substance anymore in your body. It's just uh, uh, a set of effects that uh, happens afterwards. Uh, right, so just to, to, to introduce what is actually ayahuasca for many of those who are not so familiar with it. Uh, ayahuasca is a brew of uh, a plant in a root that is quite famous in many different religions in Brazil. It actually started uh, in the indigenous communities in the Amazon, but afterwards was adopted by many other religions, such as the Catholic Church, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, so basically, it is uh, a mix of a leaf that contains uh, DMT, dimethyltryptamine, uh, which acts into a receptors, and also demoniamine oxidase inhibitors that basically cuts uh, the enzymes that cuts DMT in your brain. So that said, you are flooding your brain with DMT. Uh, the experience is quite transformative, so many reports uh, say uh, experience uh, from visual uh, hallucinations and also uh, more deep things connected to emotions and self-referential. Uh, um, and to approach this, I'm going to be inspired by the critical brain hypothesis, uh, which uh, proposes this idea that the quality of our conscious states actually uh, can be Proxied by can can uh, can be assessed by entropy of the system, and here we can think that uh, during the psychedelic experience you're going to see an increase in entropy uh, in the brain, and the same is true for sedatives and anesthesia. Then you're going to see a slight decrease, um, and during this uh, moment where the the entropy increases, we actually think that many of the, ex the, the subjective experiences, so the intensity of the experience in many dimensions, such as cognition, perception, and emotion, actually uh, relates to the entropy level. So if you have a very intense experience, perhaps the, uh, the, the level of entropy will also increase. Right, uh, so here I'm going to reduce all the brain dynamics into just one degree of freedom. So I'm just going to look into just one variable and this variable, uh, I will explain for, uh, more, but the idea is um, the brain behaves such as a system near criticality. So it's a system that behaves in the between of order and disorder. And uh, basically we have some uh, past work such as this one by Freiman that actually show us that the brain uh, behaves closer to this idea of a criticality, right? Uh, but it's really uh, nice to be in the critical, um, period because you have a uh, maximum of information transfer, information um, storage, computational power, and also some emergent phenomena such as correlation length. You have an increase in correlation length uh, spontaneously during the critical period. Uh, so here to um, use a model of brain criticality and reduce our whole dynamics into just one degree of freedom, I'm going to use the 2D easing model. Uh, the model was proposed by a physicist uh, in the early 20th century, but the idea was to describe a magnet, right? So how can you describe uh, this, uh, this physical object with a model? And the model is quite simple. It's just a lattice. Every node of the lattice is a variable, and each variable interacts with each other following this uh, quite beautiful Hamiltonian. Right, so this is a dynamical model. So it means that it actually changes over time during just using just one parameter, which is the temperature. So the temperature actually dictates the probability of changing states, which by the interaction equation will give the dynamics of the system. And because it's based on probability, it's also a stochastic system. Right, um, 
So the temperature is basically going to dictate if the system goes to order, so magnetized to disorder, so completely random, right? Um, we are interested in the critical period, which is the period where we have actually structure patterns and we actually um, know that the brain is kind of in this middle ground between order and disorder, right? Um, usually people do uh, maximum likelihood estimation to find these parameters, uh, the, the parameter of temperature, for example, but the problem is uh, you go to the brain, to the model, maximum likelihood, estimate temperature, but this just work when your data is really, really good and you have a bunch of time points and also uh, just a few ROIs. So it's not my case. Uh, my data is not good at all, actually. So I need to develop a different kind of model, a model that I can simulate the 2D easing model. I can map them into the brain and then use a model which will be a machine learning model to estimate the temperature. And the idea is that if I can simulate the, the, the Ising model, I can create a really big deep learning model, for example, to estimate the temperature of the 2D Ising model. So the idea here is actually train a model in uh, the simulations and afterwards use the same model to infer the brain temperature, which is uh, the Ising temperature of the, uh, the data from the uh, fMRI, right? Uh, but how can we do it, right? No, we need uh, first to simulate the 2D AZ model. We can use a special, a special average because the 2D AZ model is binary, so it's just one and zero, then get a continuous representation of the 2D AZ model. And now we have time series that are continuous or, um, and do uh, basically linear correlation. And we have now a network. We have a functional connectivity network. We have a graph. But the same is true for fMRI. We can do the same procedure, both for the easing model and also the fMRI. Um, this model gets really, uh, the, 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 the deep learning model uh, is based on graph neural networks, which is a very specific type of neural networks that uh, uh, works really good at, at graphs. And it gets really uh, good at predicting the temperature of simulations, right? So during the critical period, it gets like really good, which means that now we can transfer this uh, GNN to estimate our brain temperature. Perfect. Um, we have two different data sets. One data set is an acute data set, which means that we have a baseline fMRI after, uh, before the ingestion. And we have also an fMRI after the ingestion. But here we are doing the fMRI during the acute effects. In the subacute group, it's slightly different. We have now two groups, uh, the subacute data set. We have two groups. One group is a placebo, and another group, group is the ayahuasca group. Um, and here we have a baseline scan before and uh, fMRI scan one day after. During the acute effects, we register uh, the hallucinogenic rating scale, which is basically a psychometric scale that uh, you will measure many dimensions of changes in cognition, in uh, emotions, and also change in um, other systems such as perception. Uh, perfect, so uh, this is the, the first result which is just about the dynamics. In the y-axis, we have the delta of the difference, uh, the difference of the temperature, which basically means uh, the condition minus the baseline. Uh, the placebo group, we actually expect uh, Gaussian closer to zero because there is no slightly, no, there is no significant increase in your brain entropy in the placebo condition. However, in the subacute one, we actually see a slight increase even one day after, even if the substance is not in your, in your body anymore. In the acute group, of course, every one of them are above the zero. But the really interesting thing here is that we are going to look into the subacute group and check if the subjective experience, so what we measured by the hallucinogenic rating scale, actually can explain this increase in temperature. And the interesting thing here is uh, there is one specific dimension that, that is really good to predicting the, this increase in temperature, which is the changes in your emotional system. So it looks like people that report big differences in their emotional systems actually also show a bigger entropy, an increase in entropy, even when they after digestion which I think is really interesting uh, if you think um, about the potential applications of uh, such psychedelics, such as in psychiatry. And of course that we want some kind of explainability. So what we can do is basically check 
which graph metrics actually explain part of the variance of our temperature. And we see that, for example, clustering and modularity are actually um, quite related to this increasing temperature. And uh, just to conclude, uh, here there is another study uh, that was published last, uh, this year, actually, uh, that we verified over new development what happens into this idea of the brain criticality. And what we see is that over new development, actually, the temperature decreases. So um, we see also in the psychedelics, which is very interesting, that uh, the temperature uh, also decreases when you go to acute to placebo. And I'm not going to interpret anything here, but I think it's just really cool to show it to you. Uh, but there are several limitations. Uh, we don't have actually any type of uh, probability that the empirical data given the model. So that's really hard to check actually how good this model actually is to predicting and explaining our data. It's a small number of subjects. And of course, this model does not consider the geometry of the brain. There is no consideration about the receptors map. So it's very naive model. It's just kept grabbing these uh, overall dynamics. Uh, and just an extension, and I think this one is really cool, is if you get this pre-trained model, this pre-trained GNN on easy models, and you want to, for example, predict the control parameter of a Kuramoto model uh, in a scale-free network, it actually starts in a minima which I think is really interesting because it looks like this kind of deep learning models trained on simulations can actually get a really smart representation of those complex systems and maybe encode more deep information that we actually just capturing with the control parameter. And uh, you can also check your own temperature if you want. So this model is deployed, but you need to follow a specific parcellation, which is the Gorson's parcellation. 333 ROIs, uh, but then you can just simply grab your functional connectivity matrices and, and check uh, which is the temperature of the matrix. And that's it. Uh, so thank you, everyone.